Well, let's, uh, let's uh, return to that reading that we had, Acts chapter 8, and uh, the section that we read to you, verse 26 to verse uh, 40. Now, we're not going to get very far in this section, really. Um, I was hoping we, we might. In fact, I was even hoping we might even do the whole section, but uh, things don't work out like that, especially when I sit down and I start praying and thinking and preparing. Uh, but really, we're just going to be doing an introduction uh, to this one man, the Ethiopian eunuch of Acts chapter 8. So let's remind ourselves, uh, by way of introduction, of what we know already, uh, what was previously we thought about. Uh, there was a revival, a revival in Samaria. And the Samaritans were coming to faith in the Lord Jesus, uh, but then Philip, in the midst of, uh, of that time of revival, perhaps as we suggested uh, some weeks ago, uh, might have had a shock when uh, through the Spirit, uh, Philip uh, is told to leave that uh, revival scene and go out to a desert road. Uh, who is he going to meet? What's going to happen? Well, we'll see in this passage. So verse 26 of Acts 8 says this, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Uh, this is desert. So we get the picture there that this is a, um, a desolate area. Uh, there's not much, uh, not many, much population. Um, it's very quiet. Unlike the hustle and the bustle of Samaria and what was going on, uh, with the people there coming to faith. And uh, we, 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 we uh, thought last time about how um, Philip uh, took the, the word of the angel and obeyed it as God's word and went. And there must have been many questions, but he went. That's the important thing. He went to meet a man. And so what we're going to be thinking of uh, this evening is who is this man? Well, we need uh, to go, uh, there's the question, who is this man? We need to go uh, and discover that he is an Ethiopian. And uh, we find that in the next verse, verse 27. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. And uh, we're not going to go much further than that verse uh, this evening because we want to get a picture of who this man is that Philip is uh, about to meet. Well, this man, uh, we're not told much information about him other than the fact that he's an Ethiopian. And as far as we are aware of, uh, he's not a Jew. Uh, though there's a possibility that he might have been a Jew. And the possibility is because of the days of uh, uh, the, the days at the end of the prophet Jeremiah, because if there was a, there was a remnant of Jewish people who were left after Nebuchadnezzar had uh, sacked uh, Jerusalem, and there was a group that escaped into Egypt, and at this time, especially in the days of Jeremiah, there was a connection between Ethiopia and Egypt. So there's possibility, this is only a possibility, nobody can prove it, that this uh, Ethiopian was possibly descended from some of those people that escaped from, uh, the, uh, from Nebuchadnezzar and had arrived to Egypt and eventually, uh, because there was a sort of combination of Ethiopia and Egypt as a, as an, as a kingdom, uh, moved possibly uh, to Ethiopia. And maybe his generations have then become very much Ethiopian. But what we can say of him, I think, is that he's probably more likely to be of Ethiopian and Egypt extraction rather than of a Jewish heritage. But from somewhere, he has heard of, and it seems he has believed in the God of the Jews, uh, Jehovah, Yahweh. Uh, and he's made that God to be his God. He's come to Jerusalem and he's come to the center of the Jewish world and the Jewish religion 
Jerusalem and the temple. So here is this Ethiopian. But the second point to note is that he is a eunuch. Now, uh, because he was a eunuch, it meant that he, even in his greatest desire and ambition, he could never be a proper Jew. Uh, you could become a Jew if you were a Gentile. That would involve circumcision. It would involve going through a certain rite, which also, uh, interestingly, involved uh, um, a kind of baptism in which you were, uh, water was poured all over you uh, as a sort of cleansing, and there would be involved a series of fasts and uh, a special ritual uh, that you could go through, and you would be then, uh, as a proselyte, be considered as a Jew. But this man couldn't be, because in the Old Testament, in the uh, laws of Moses, uh, no eunuch was allowed to come into the, uh, the inner court of the temple. Uh, they weren't allowed to be priests. They weren't allowed to function uh, in uh, the way that ordinary uh, Jewish people would have been able to do. He would be forbidden as he goes to Jerusalem to enter uh, the, those courts where ordinary Jewish people would worship at the temple. He would only be able to go to the outer court, which was the court of the Gentiles, and he would only be able to see things from a distance. He, it would take um, some good eyesight to see the priests uh, offering the sacrifices where he was. In fact, the, the court of the Gentiles was basically a, a thoroughfare where people would travel from one part of Jerusalem to the other through the outer court of the Gentiles. It was a place where they were so selling the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the pigeons or the doves for sacrifice, or they were exchanging the money for Roman coinage to, to the temple money. So that was all he could do, really. That's about as far as they, he was allowed to participate. And there's a, a, a point being made here, I think, that as far as the Jewish rulers were concerned, and as far as Jewish tra tradition would have it, they would have said to this man that you are not fit for heaven. You may have God, Jehovah, as your God, but you're not fit for heaven. You're even worse than a Gentile because you are a eunuch. He would not certainly have been expected to be a man of God. So that poses a question here. Why preach the gospel to him? Why tell him about Jesus and eternal life if he is not able to have that eternal life? as the Jewish leaders would have said, as the Jewish tradition would have said. Why would God even bother with him if there are these rules and these regulations in the Old Testament? And surely God would seem to have no interest in someone like him. But here's the interesting point. Philip had experience of preaching the gospel to people who were according to the Jewish leaders, unfit for heaven, and discovered that, in fact, that they did come to faith in Jesus and that they were believers in Jesus and were having eternal life. Philip had spent, we don't know how long, weeks, months maybe, preaching to Samaritans. And Samaritans were, as far as the Jewish leaders are concerned, uh, uh, almost as bad as Gentiles. And certainly not the kind of people that God would want in heaven. And Philip has this experience, doesn't he? He has preached to people who the Jewish leaders and Jewish rulers, Jewish tradition said, these are the people who will not go to heaven. So he's had some experience of preaching to someone like this Ethiopian. But God doesn't treat people like that, does he? All that is tradition. There's another man that we can discover in the Old Testament this time, whom God called to be his own and to come to faith in him, despite obvious disqualifications. 
That man is Naaman. Uh, we find Naaman mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, we begin, uh, first of all, to discover that he is a powerful man. Uh, he, the Bible describes him as a mighty man of valor. He's a soldier. But it's got two negatives. First of all, he's a Syrian. So that's pretty bad. He's not a Jew. He's a Syrian. But more telling is that he's a leper. He's unclean. No Jew, no respected, holy man of God should go anywhere near lepers. And in a way, Naaman and the Ethiopian are in a similar circumstance. But God brings Naaman to, him, to himself. Naaman believes in the God uh, Jehovah, the God of Israel. And this was also true of the Ethiopian as well. Now, we, we have a very important application here. And it's this, that no man or no woman is beyond the reach of God. Whether you're a Samaritan or a leper or a eunuch, no man is beyond the reach of God to become a real believer in the Lord Jesus, to have real faith in Christ, in order to have eternal life. And we're going to see this again in the next chapter, when we, we think about Saul uh, of Tarsus, Saul the great persecutor of the early church. The man, perhaps, that even in the church, uh, might have said, well, he's the last person who will ever come to faith in Jesus. Last person who would ever be a Christian. Well, we're going to discover in Acts chapter 9 that that's not true. Because God calls Saul of Tarsus, of course, to himself, to real faith in Jesus, and to be an apostle. But uh, when Philip sees him, uh, what is this Ethiopian doing? Uh, I've often thought about uh, uh, Philip coming through the sort of desert scrubland comes to this particular road, uh, this desert road. Uh, I've often thought about the Ethiopian sort of sitting in a kind of lay-by, uh, reading a scroll. But I think if you read the Bible, uh, read the passage here, it's actually the, the chariot, the, 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 the wagon, if you like, that he's in, it seems to be going, moving. <laughs> So maybe he's able to read as he travels. I can't do that. It makes me feel sick. But this is what the, the Ethiopian eunuch is doing. He's reading. Uh, perhaps he's reading, but perhaps more interestingly, maybe looking at his latest acquisition from uh, Jerusalem. And what we're told is that he is reading from an Old Testament scroll, uh, an Old Testament book, and it's a book of Isaiah. And that tells us something else about this man. And the something else is our next point. So I obviously should have pressed the button for verse 27, but there we are. So he rose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority. We dealt with that. So the third point, he is a rich man. Now how do, how do we know that? Well, for this one simple reason, he has a scroll. He has the scroll of the book of Isaiah. And uh, those scrolls in the days of uh, Jesus, in the days of Paul, were expensive. They were handwritten by the scribes, and they were meticulous. So if there was a m one mistake uh, uh, in the scroll, then the scroll would be destroyed. And so this scroll that he has is a precious, expensive scroll of uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, only a rich person or possibly a, a rich synagogue would be able to purchase these kind of scrolls. And we could possibly say that Isaiah might have been a very expensive scroll as well because it's got 66 chapters. So it's a lengthy book isn't it? Um, it, it, isn't, it isn't a short book, like uh, perhaps one of the minor prophets, but it's a lengthy uh, book to purchase. And so very few people could afford such scrolls. 
And we're told what, what he's doing. He arose as Philip went. Behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. That's obviously telling us again that he's obviously a, a man of very great importance and authority. So he is obviously a man of some substance, some wealth. He had charge of all her treasury. So he's a money man. And money men make money, don't they? Usually. I've never really met a poor accountant yet. So uh, money men make money. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. And then verse 28. Sorry, I've got that one wrong. I think. Uh, verse 28. And I haven't got it uh, on the screen. I should have done. Verse 28 tells us also that he was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah uh, the prophet. prophet. So here's, a, here's an application for you. Just how precious is the Bible to you? How precious is the Bible to you? Uh, sometimes when I... Um, go on the internet and uh, go on some of these Christian bookstores that are on the internet. Uh, just comes across sometimes uh, uh, about the price of Bibles. Now, obviously, you can get a, uh, a cheap Bible. I, I bought a Bible six months ago. It only cost me a pound. It's probably going to fall apart in about four weeks, but uh, it was very cheap. But some of the Bibles that you can buy can cost over a hundred pounds, you know, special type of leather, special type of paper, gold leaf, and all that, and becomes very, very expensive. But we're not talking about the monetary price here. What we're talking about is something more important, the spiritual price of the Scriptures. How, how precious is the Bible to you? Uh, do you see it? Do you know it? to be the very words of God that God has given to us uh, and in that, in that result, precious. See, our Ethiopian knew a, a real treasure, didn't he? Uh, after all, he was in charge of the, the queen's treasury and what he had in his hand, in terms of mon monetary co cost, was very expensive. But I think he also knew that it was great treasure, real treasure because this was God's word. But the interesting thing is this, as we see the passage, he didn't understand it. He could read the words, perhaps he understood the words, but he didn't understand what was being said. So that poses us uh, another question. Why did he have it in the first place? Why did he have it? Well, that comes to Number four, which I can't move for some known reason, which is he had come to Jerusalem to worship. That again tells us that there was some faith, some belief in the God of Israel at this point. Let me re uh, quote uh, to you verse 27 again. If I let, better let John do that, because I don't think this is working, I don't know why. Um, but verse 27 tells us, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen uh, of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, let's, let's paint a picture here. Ethiopia is a long way from Jerusalem. This would involve days and weeks of travel. And not easy travel. Uh, this wasn't a, a normal route for, for Roman soldiers. It may well have involved having to go from Ethiopia into Egypt and from Egypt into, uh, into Judea and then into Jerusalem. And he was going to the temple. He was going to worship. We're told there, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship, which really means that he had come to the temple, because the temple was the place of worship. And that tells us that there was something 
about this man. He had a, a faith. He had a belief in the God of the Jews. And it wasn't just a, oh, I'm going to make the God of the Jews my God and, uh, and that's it. There was a, zeal, a zealousness about him, a zeal about him. There was a commitment uh, to it. Uh, his uh, believing in the God of the Jews, it involved him in a number of things. It involved him uh, a cost in terms of money, you know, leaving his employment, uh, having, <laughs> I don't know if he had holiday pay, but if he, he probably didn't. He would have had to uh, forego his wages for some time. It would involve a cost in time, a cost in energy, and uh, 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 it, would, uh, it would have involved him in a lot of expense, uh, physical and mental expense as well. And yet, when you think about it, what we've been, the picture we've been painting is this. Yet, even when he arrives at Jerusalem, he's not able to worship God like the other Jews would have been able to do. He is a foreigner. Not only is he a foreigner, which is bad enough, but he's a eunuch. And he is barred from the full participation and the acceptance as a, a believer in a Jehovah. He's not able to get into the very center of worship. He would only ever be able to be the outsider looking in. And I think that tells us something important about this man's faith and belief. It tells us, I think, that he had a strong faith in the God of Israel, that he had a strong faith in Jehovah. But let's, uh, let's give a, a point of application here again once more and to ask a question. How much does your worship of Jesus cost you? For this man to go to Jerusalem, it cost him money, it cost him time. Um, it, it cost him a great deal. How much does your worship of Jesus cost you? Is it only a, a service on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening? Is it only a, an occasional reading of the scriptures, an occasional time of prayer? Is there a real commitment to Jesus? This man, I would suggest to you, has a real commitment to Jehovah, to the God of Israel. Well, the fifth point, and I think I'm going to ask John to move that on. He has the scriptures, but he doesn't understand them. So if we could have verse 30 and verse 31, we read there, So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me and he asked Philip to come up and sit with him well that's quite a statement for for this man isn't it uh, who's Philip I haven't got a clue but Philip's asked him a question do you understand what you're reading he seems to be an answer perhaps uh, perhaps we might even say that the Ethiopian eunuch might have prayed and asked God to open his eyes to understand what he's got in front of him, this scroll from the prophet Isaiah, the passage that he's reading, Isaiah 53. And then comes Philip and says, do you understand what you're reading? Well, maybe that Ethiopian eunuch had a bit more um, spiritual insight than we perhaps give him credit for. He asked Philip to come along up on his chariot or his wagon or whatever he was being transported in, and we're going to see next time, of course, that Philip is able to interpret, explain the passage that he's reading. But there's an application here as we draw to a close uh, this evening. And that is, for many, for many, many people, uh, the Bible seems to be a closed book. And even a boring one with so many pages. I mean, after all, it's got 66 books in it. 
And uh, that, that can be a tough time if you keep reading the Bible, can't you? Sometimes you read, and I've read of certain professors of theology in universities who uh, are, are learned, they're academic, uh, they can say a lot about uh, the scriptures, but sadly they don't know the author. They don't know God. And uh, the Bible for them is just an academic book. Well, the Bible isn't an academic book. It's God's book. It's God's word uh, to God's people. But perhaps like the Ethiopian, we need someone to help us. That's what Philip is going to be doing. He's going to help this Ethiopian understand what he's reading. And for the Ethiopian to have a deeper, deeper faith. Well, like the Ethiopian, perhaps we need someone to help us read the word. To know the word and to understand the word. See, primarily, our guide to the scriptures is the Holy Spirit. And second, secondary, that of faithful pastors and faithful teachers of the word also. Perhaps like me, you've often heard, uh, uh, by way of testimony, that once a person has come to faith, and I've heard this several times from several people, then they've said, well, when I've come to faith in Jesus, the Bible has become a new book to me. And it's God, the Holy Spirit, that's opening the eyes of people who have believed in Jesus to be able to read it in a different way. But why? Well, because of the author. You know, a book is much easier uh, to read if you know the author. And God is the author of the Bible, isn't he? And through the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, then God is our guide, our helper, and our enlightener to its words and to its meanings and to its context and to its teachings. So perhaps we can end by asking another question, and that is, how then can we understand the Bible for ourselves? Well, I suggested, first of all, and this is the most important thing, you need to know the author, the author of the book. When you know the author, you can see things more clearly from the book. Now, uh, in our family, my, my sister-in-law, I'm going to say one of my sister-in-laws, sister actually I've got two, haven't I, Jane? But one of my sister-in-laws has written two books. She's an author. Uh, a few years ago, I would have said an authoress, but I'm not allowed to say that anymore. She's an author. And the, author, the first book that she wrote was kind of semi-biographical. And if you knew her, and you read the book, you'd enjoy the book more because you know more about her. You know the way that she talks, the way that she thinks, something of her life. And it just made the book so fascinating and so interesting. And it becomes that because you know the person who wrote it. And that's true for the believer in Jesus. Because we know Jesus, because we belong to God, when we read the Bible, the Bible comes alive to us through God the Holy Spirit because we know God. And we hear God's word speaking to us through his word. So, first of all, if you want to try to understand the Bible, you need to be a believer in Jesus. You need to come to faith in Christ. But then the second thing is this. We need to pray to God for understanding and wisdom. Because even when we are believers, we can still be in a situation of the Ethiopian unit. We read the Bible, but yet we haven't been able to work it out or fathom it or understand what the Bible is saying sometimes. That's why we need to pray. Pray for wisdom. Pray for understanding. To know the word better. A third thing, there's only four things, so there's only two more to go. The third thing is this, look out for good and wise teachers of the word. We thought about this, uh, I think, uh, last Wednesday in our Bible study when we were looking at Titus chapter 1 and we 
She heard there that Paul was talking about false teachers coming out with false doctrines. Well, the situation hasn't changed much since Paul's day. There are still false teachers with false doctrines. And we need to look for, out for those who know the Bible and know the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are good and wise teachers of the Lord. Third, sorry, fourth thing, last thing, is that uh, when we're not able, perhaps, to uh, have some wise teachers or some uh, good teachers, or perhaps even the wise and good teachers are not able to understand the word, that happens, of course, then uh, look to the best commentators of God's word, the best interpreters of God's word, men and women of God who know God, godly men and godly wisdom. Uh, women who understand that the Bible, the scriptures, are the very words of God and have dwelt on it, meditated on, studied it, and have known God speaking to them through it. Well, how do we understand the Bible? Well, the first thing, most important thing, is that we know God. If we know God, then through God, the Holy Spirit, especially, we will know God speaking to us through his word. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we <coughs> come before you now and uh, give you praise and thanks for your kindness, mercy, and love towards us. And Father, we thank you that you have given us the scriptures, and we praise you and thank you that you have given us God the Holy Spirit too, as the great interpreter of your word. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you have not left us alone in, the, in some dark place, but that through your word, uh, through your servants, through God the Holy Spirit, taking and applying your word, you speak to us. Uh, and uh, Lord, you uh, speak to our hearts and to our minds. And we pray, Lord, not only our minds, but our hearts may be touched by your word so that not only do we understand it, but we know you through it and know what you would have us to do and how we can be faithful servants to our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to see the word of God, the, the, our Bibles, to be a very precious treasure indeed. And Lord, when we are perhaps uh, perplexed or uh, don't quite understand some passage in which we're dealing with, then Lord, grant us through your grace that uh, discernment and understanding, and wisdom, or to perhaps find uh, a Philip who can help us to understand those scriptures so that those scriptures, through your grace and mercy, would feed us and nourish our souls. We pray this in Jesus' name.